it started off just like a little spider sitting on my shoulder. I'm quite tall, I'm six foot three and my wife is five foot one. So something that she doesn't often see is the top of my shoulder. Well, actually neither do I, because if I looked like this, I can't really see anything either. And if I look into the mirror, it was right on the top of my shoulder. So it was actually quite fortuitous, quite lucky that we managed to spot it at all. I just had a shower and I was sitting on the side of the bed and my wife said, Andre, don't move, you have a spider on your shoulder. And I said, I can't believe that. And she came a bit closer and she said, it's not a spider, it's a little mole. And the little mole was, well, well, wasn't so little, it was about half the size of the top of a pen. And it had little legs on it, tiny little legs, like one millimeter long. And it looked really weird, but what really put me off is it was pitch black. And so I said to my wife, don't worry, I'll, take, I'll go to the doctor and I'll have it checked out. Now, I'm not a doctor person. I don't really go to the doctor, but it just so happened that three days later I had to go to the doctor to get a prescription. And I nearly forgot. And I said to the doctor, as I was there, oh yes, I just remember I got this little spider on my shoulder. And what he did is he had a look at it and he got this very serious face. And he said to me, Andre, uh, come in tomorrow and I'm going to cut it out. But you know, even at that point, I didn't realize anything was going wrong. Because I'm at that age where I'm getting lots of bumps and lumps and spots and things. And I, another one didn't really make so much of a difference. Anyway, he cut it out and it was quite a big cut. It had 14 stitches. Um, and he took this thing out and he said, no, the roots were quite deep. And we left it at that. Three days later, I got a phone call from him and he said to me, Andre, you need to come see me. Um, the results are not great. But even then, I didn't really panic. I wasn't really worried about anything. And when I got there, the first thing that I noticed is that everybody at that practice, who I've been going for 25 years, knows me by name. Everyone sort of greets me. Hi, big positive guy. Hello, Andre. How are you? From the cleaner to the receptionist to the nurse to the other doctors. But this day, they all ignored me. They all looked down as if they were suddenly terribly busy. The nurse scurried into her little office. Even the cleaner disappeared and I couldn't see her. When I went into the doctor's office, he also wouldn't look me in the eye. All he was doing was reading the astrology reports and it was a big wad of papers that he was reading. And he kept going through and going, mm, yes, 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 yes. And eventually, without looking up, he said to me, Andre, the news is not really very good. You have a very aggressive uh, malignant loma, melanoma um, of the maximum depth, in fact, double the maximum depth that we normally measure it. And I need you to see an oncologist straight away. And I was trying to get him to connect with me because I'm a people's person. I wanted him to talk to me and say what was going on, but he never, ever looked up. And when he was finished and he said to me, this is where I'm going to send you, uh, I said to him, Paul, look at me. I said, what, what must I do? What's going on? And he said to me, Andre, you better be positive. You better be positive because this is not going to be an easy ride. <laughs> I laughed and I said, I'm the big positive guy. Don't tell me to be positive. I'm the king of positive. I know exactly what positive means. Well, I went home and I did the unforgivable sin. I, I couldn't quite understand the astrology and I'm quite intelligent, but there was just so many big words and things. So what I did is I just typed in the summary into Google. I literally took the words off the, off the astrology, punched them into Google, and then the first word that came up was this is a certain death sentence. I was like, whoa, that's not what I wanted to read. And so I typed in life expectancy. And what they did is they then popped back up again and it said you had a 15% life expectancy after five years. I then suddenly realized while my doctor wasn't looking me in the eye, I had managed to get myself a very aggressive form of a malignant melanoma. And I don't know how long it had been there. Maybe it was a few days, maybe it was a few weeks, but it could have been a few years for all I know. And all I know is that everybody was telling me that this was really, really serious. I'm not frightened of dying. Uh, that's not really an issue. Um, but immediately all these thoughts started coming to my head. And, and that's maybe my first lesson for you today. I think we sometimes wait and we muddle through life getting busy and only when something serious happens we have what I call moments of clarity. When a partner dies, when a parent dies, when we lose jobs, when we're struck by COVID and we think we potentially could die, or the threat of COVID is frightening us. And then suddenly, just for a few days, for a few hours, sometimes, sometimes for a few weeks, we have absolute clarity about what we should have been doing with our lives, how we should have been doing it, 
and what's actually going on. Well, I had the reverse. I had absolute panic attacks. I had panic attacks for almost three or four days. I've never been scared in my life. I was waking up in the middle of the night with my heart beating at 200 beats a minute, sweat pouring down my head, convinced that I was having a heart attack. And all it was, it was fear. But fear of a different kind, not fear of dying. Fear that I hadn't done everything that I wanted to do. And that's probably the worst kind of fear that you have, is because we can live a life, but we cannot live that life. And so for me, it was a situation of I quickly summed it up and I thought to myself, there's three things I want to do. Dr. Google had said to me, it can be anywhere from three weeks to 12 months. And so that was a really short time. So I thought if I've got three weeks, well, well, stuff that I'm just going to drink a lot, kiss my wife a lot, um, and probably make sure that the world is up to date. If it was 12 months, I was going to do a lot more. I was going to take the family away on holidays. I was going to go do a lot more things. But there was a third part of me that said I was going to fight this. I was going to use every resource within my capacity to see if I could actually extend my lifespan. I then managed to get into Grotesquieu to see the oncology unit and firstly let me just say they come highly recommended and their reputation is totally deserved. Um, I was fortunate enough to see the chief oncologist and she sat there and she chatted to me. I didn't know she was the chief oncologist. She chatted to me and she said to me, Andre, this is quite serious and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take charge of your little team. And the little team ended up being eight people, of which three of them were professors of, of cancer, of oncology, uh, two plastic surgeons, anaesthetists, all kinds of amazing people. And I started going for test after test after test. That afternoon they called me in, and when I say called me in, we literally had a little board meeting. We sat there with eight doctors and myself, and they told me what they'd found. And they said it was an extremely virulent uh, melanoma, it was far too deep. The doctor had done a fantastic job taking it out, but he hadn't taken all of it out. They were finding cancer cells everywhere. Um, they were extremely concerned because of the depth that it had spread. And the conversation generally wasn't very positive. One of the things that I then did is I asked the doctor, because I had so many questions in my head. But when I eventually he said to me, do you have any questions? I just said, yeah, I've just got one. Am I going to die? And he looked at me and they all got very serious. And then he said to me, yes, you're going to die. And then they all burst out laughing. They must do this with every cancer patient. And he said, I just don't know when. And again, he said to me, Andre, your attitude will determine whether you live or die. I'm a mathematician. I can't understand that. By being positive, by having a good attitude, am I physically changing the cellular structure in my body? Well, it appears it is so. One of the things that I find exceptionally strange, everyone says well, people with good, strong attitudes tend to survive these things and people that give up generally die. So facing all of this, I went home and I had a slightly greater sense of confidence. Firstly, because my team was absolutely amazing, but I immediately started putting a whole lot of stuff into place just to make sure that everything that I was doing was the right thing. And so I went back to the doctor, but I'd completely misunderstood. They said they were going to do something called a sentinel node biopsy. They were going to check to see where the cancer had spread to. Um, and then the next day they were going to do this operation on my back. Um, I strolled in there with my shorts, t-shirts and pluckies, um, not realizing that once you get into hospital today, you don't get out. So the first thing, they just laughed at me and said, where's your luggage? Where's your stuff? And I was like, what luggage? What stuff? I'm doing the, the, the test and then I'm going home. They was like, once you come into this place, you do not leave again. And so what started off as a, a very casual test, I thought, ended up being an immediate COVID test and then just test after test after test. The sentinel node biopsy is like something out of science fiction. They inject a tiny little grain, he says it's smaller than a grain of salt, into your back, right into the wound of where they've just taken out the, the last piece of cancer. And then they follow it using something called your, your lymph, lymphatic system. And they try to see if the cancer is going to spread, where would it go to? I went, mine went into four different places. It went up here behind my neck, behind my ear. It went up here under my throat. It went under my breast and it went under my arm. And I said to my doc the doctor, what, did, why did, what does that mean? And he said, wherever it's going to spread to, that's likely where it's going to keep on going. The lymph nodes will hold it there for a while, but it will spread. So if you're going to spread, it's probably likely that you're either going to get brain, uh, throat, or lung cancer. 
<laughs> I don't really want any one of those three. Those are three crappy versions. Uh, maybe the one that really concerned me the most was the one in my throat because I'd been up to the ward and I'd seen a person there and he was snorting like a horse and I thought, take some sinu tabs, guy. You sound terrible. And then what happens, I discovered they'd just taken away his lower jaw. And I thought to myself, don't do that to me. How am I going to talk? I'm just going to ho, ho, ho. That's not going to be the funniest thing in the world. The next day, or that night, uh, the anaesthetist came to visit me and he said to me, Mr. Latoy, can we just go through your history? He weighed about 50 kilograms. And a, a, a doctor, I won't name his name, but he, he's Chinese. And he's a small little guy and, and he looked at me in absolute horror. And he, he went through the whole process and he said, do you have this? Do you have this? And I was like, yes, yes, yes. I've got just about everything. All the gifts that nature can give you. I've got most of them in some form or the other. But obviously one of the things that really concerned me was last year I had really struggled with my asthma, a lifelong asthmatic. Last year my asthma had really got out of control. And I was living on the nebulizer. So he looked at me and he said, Mr. Detoy, he said, you're a difficult case. And what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to intubate you. I was like, please, Lord, don't say that. Because the only thing that frightens me about COVID is that intubation, the inability to communicate, the inability to speak, for me, was probably the worst sentence. The thing that he also didn't doesn't know is that I'm extremely claustrophobic. You can't even, I can't scarcely wear the mask. And so he said to me, I, I, so I said to him, doctor, I just want to say something to you. If I wake up and that thing is still there, I will take it out myself and I will hurt anyone who comes close to me. That's how claustrophobic I am. And he was very quiet for about a minute. And he said to me, Mr. Detoy, you've got to get over yourself. He said, you are so big that I'm not physically capable of intubating you if something goes wrong. So not only are you going to be intubated, but you're going to help me intubate you. You're going to get into the position and you're going to help me through this entire process. Well, it's one of those times you just want to go, oh my goodness, you know, you've got to be serious. I learned something about myself. You can do almost anything. You really can. As long as your head is in the right space. And so for that whole night, I sat there after the discussion with a, with a friend of mine, and I sat and I visualized the things. I went through the process. I calmed myself down. I made a whole lot of techniques, used a whole lot of techniques. Just prepare myself for what obviously is going to be something quite scary. Now I must tell you something, and maybe for the rest of you this is not so scary. But for me it was terrifying because in 60 years of age, I have never ever had an anesthetic. I have never ever been to the hospital. I've never had an operation. So my first one was going to be a doozy. Uh, and so I had to go through all of this nonsense. And on top of that, you're completely isolated. You're away from your family. You're sitting in a totally foreign environment. I'm claustrophobic of rooms. So even taking me into the theater required me to close my eyes and do certain breathing techniques just so I didn't panic from being in this enclosed little room. Well, I did quite well, I think. Um, and at a certain point, as I could feel the, the bile rushing up through my throat, all I could hear was the doctor saying, two milligrams, please, and that, please. that was all I remember. Then I was out. But I, I'd gone through a lot of stuff, which I haven't even had the guts to write about. Five hours later, uh, I thought I was awake, but I wasn't. Um, I'd come out from under the anesthetic, so I was in that sort of state of half sleep, half awake, um, but I couldn't wake up. And all I could sense was like, it was close. I could hear the voices. I could feel them messing with my arm. Um, I didn't know what was going on. And I kept, as I was about to wake up, I'd sink back. It was almost like being underwater. Uh, and what I, I then thought immediately is that I've obviously died. I must have died. And they're trying to resuscitate me. And this is that space. Somebody is going, I was looking for a light. There was no light. I was waiting, but I was in this dreamy state. And eventually I woke up. And I said to the, the nurse immediately, and I said to her, did I die? And she said, your consultant would speak to you, which immediately confirmed to me that I died on the table. When the consultant eventually came around and spoke to me, I said, did I die? And she just laughed and laughed. And she said, you didn't die. You just had very low blood pressure. And we took a long time to wake you up. It took about 45 minutes to wake you up. I'd booked to go away that weekend. This was Thursday night. Um, I phoned my wife on Thursday night, and I said, I thought I'd be home. Um, because I'd been told that you go home for most things, you have a bypass, they send you home the next night. Um, so I thought I'd be home, but they were like, no, 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 this is quite a big operation. 
and you're just going to stay exactly where you are. So I cancelled my weekend away, which was a good thing because I really, really took a long time to recover from the anaesthetic. But what they'd done is they'd taken a slab of meat from my back. And I'd always known that that was what they're going to do, but I hadn't realized how big it was going to be. So if you've ever spoiled yourself and you've been to a nice hotshot steakhouse and you've ordered yourself a 500 gram rump, that's what they took out of my back. An enormous piece of flesh, absolutely perfectly put back together again. Literally to the point that you could run your hand over the hole and there was absolutely no difference. It's like somebody had sandpapered it smooth again. An absolutely incredible job. They'd taken out a whole lot of stuff under my arms and things and all the lymph nodes, and, and, but I couldn't see anything because I was so bandaged up, so I just left it. Pain, nothing. I don't know why. Maybe I've got a high pain threshold. Maybe they did a brilliant job. Um, the only negative thing I've ever seen during this entire process was a very upset sister writing in my notes saying, Mr. DeToy absolutely point blank refuses to take any pain medication. We will keep trying, but he doesn't want to take it. And in the entire process, I have never taken one pain tablet. So I must just say those doctors did an exquisite job on me and I was very grateful. But now I had to cope with the process of having to wait for the diagnosis. And I had to wait for what was actually going to happen. And then my friend Louis phoned me, and he was very upset by the fact that I was about to kick the bucket, or potentially about to kick the bucket, and he said, let's go for lunch. And we had this long lunch, and, and I often have bounced things off him, and I said to him, Louis, I'd like to ask you one question. I said, I have too many followers, I have too many people that follow me on social media. The reality is I want the truth to come out. I don't want a version of the truth to come out. I want, I want to know how I can make sure that I can control the process of what's actually happening. Um, because I don't want my life to change. I don't want people to treat me differently. And so Louis and I chatted about this quite a long time and he eventually said to me, Andre, you know, it's never ever going to stay quiet. So why don't you take hold of the process and just and make the announcement and just and keep the keep people involved. I'm the big positive guy, so the last thing I want to do is have this long sad story about me and having cancer, blah blah blah. And so what I did is I wrote one paragraph on my Facebook page and I said, this is a tough post for me to write, but I've been diagnosed with this and this cancer, I don't want it to be on this Facebook page, so there's a separate group where I will keep people updated if they want to, if they want to keep up to date. And let's put it out there. I was absolutely shocked. The response was enormous. Within 48 hours, I must have had over two and a half thousand wishes of goodwill. I think eventually it ended up being over 4,000 people wished me well. And, and I think most of them actually meant it. I think there were a few rubberneckers that wanted to see the accident and see what happened. Um, but most of them were absolutely amazing. And that's the second thing which I've learned. I've always said, the following expression, you've heard me in presentation saying, the words that come out of your mouth become your reality. And so I started getting letters and emails from people saying, Andre, you said this to me, and you said that to me, and this is what it's meant. And I was, you've got to be kidding me. One lady said to me, you spoke at a presentation in Pretoria in 2012, and you finished off your sentence, you finished off your presentation, with the following words, every single day, look into the mirror and say, am I being the best version of myself? And she said, you know, Andre, I took you seriously. And every day I looked in the mirror and she said, I thought to myself, am I being the best version of myself? Well, she changed a few things. She got divorced. She wasn't prepared to sit in a, in a marriage that was loveless and had no benefits. She left her job and found another position. And now, it's what, nine years later? And I said to her, and how's it going now? She said, Andre, I have the most magnificent job. I have found love again, and my life is complete. And every morning, I look in the mirror and I say, am I being the best version of myself? I was shocked. Because you know, sometimes as speakers, we just, the words come out. But have we really thought about the impact that they're having? And so one of the things that I was delighted to see is that over the last couple of years, is that words that I'd said, had impacted individuals, even if it's just a few individuals, and it made a substantial difference. And so I was determined that for whatever what the road was ahead for me, 
is that the words that came out of my mouth would be positive. In the hospital, despite my absolute paranoia and fear, I made a conscious decision up front that these doctors were going through absolute hell. And I think all of us know at the moment, and it's happening right now again, is that these doctors are working 24 hours, sometimes 12 hours, 13 hours, normal guys, normal people like you and me, and dealing with people dying, people with people yelling, dying, people yelling at them. And one of the things I want to say to you is that all I did, all I did is I encouraged them. Wow, doctor, you're doing amazing. When last did you get some sleep? Can I buy you something? Can I go buy you a snack at the canteen? I made all those little statements. If I was in pain, if somebody, the one doctor had to put some drips into my arm and, and was really struggling to find the thing and was sticking the needle in all over the place, and I was adamant that I would not show any pain, I would say, doctor, you're doing a good job. Go for it, you're nearly there. It encouraged them enormously. And you know what happened? I believe I got better treatment. I honestly do. I believe I was spoilt. Not because I'm an amazing guy, not because they knew who I was, but purely because I was respectful, cheerful, and positive. So for me, that's probably one of the other great lessons that I've done. The words that come out of our mouth and the way that we treat other people very often determines the quality of our own lives. Positivity. And the doctor said to me, be positive. And I laughed and said, I'm the big positive guy. It really concerned me because I thought, here I am, I've picked this name, thanks Lee, that we've picked this name and I'm not 100% sure. I was sure yesterday, but today I'm not so sure. What does being positive mean? Does positive mean that I'm smiling, that my heart is breaking? Smiling because, you know, I, I've got to show this, this positive face. Do I tell jokes and, and, and keep everybody else, the else's spirits up? What do I do? What does positivity mean? And then a very good friend of mine phoned me and he said to me, Andre, I'd like you to come to my wedding. And I said, when is it? And he, and he said to me, it's, it's on the 26th. I said, you've got to be kidding me. That's like five days away. Can you not see all the drama that's going on in my life? You want me to come to your wedding? And he said, no, not this year, next year. And the little key fell into place. You know, positivity, the only way that I can describe it now is the belief that I think there's something better still to come. I believe that the good things in my life are still coming. To sit and dwell in the past glories of your life is one of the worst ways to live a life. To continuously say that the good things have come and gone and that there's nothing forward into the future is the one way to kill positivity. It's also the same definition for me as hope. So those two words started becoming the same thing, positivity and hope. I believe that I have a purpose. I believe that I have a reason. I believe I have things still to do. And as long as I have those things, it enables me to be positive. Two weeks we waited because the way that they work at Critters Kid, all the doctors want to see you simultaneously. And all these doctors are mostly in private practice so that they get together on a specific day and they see all the people and with all the results. My healing was phenomenal. I healed beautifully. Everything was fine. I had the staples taken out, 48 staples in my back to keep everything together. They took it out and it was, somebody said, how sore was it? I said, it was like being stung by a bee. It's sore, nothing that really is going to make you panic. Under my armpit, which was where I think most of the, 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 the operation was, um, also beautifully done. And, and I still believe in a year or two's time you won't even see a scar. But I was a bit nervous and I kept distracting my family, I kept distracting myself. We went out and we went for walks and we saw movies and we bribed and we, would, we did everything we could to take our minds off the whole process of what was actually happening. And then on the day, this was the big day, we had to go in, but it was a different day. It was now there was no more putting off the stories and trying to distract yourself. Now it was bite hard and just go and see what it needs to be done. But as I said before, as I'm a very logical kind of guy, a very serious kind of guy, um, and so I don't really take things like signs and symbols into account. I see a lot of people like that kind of thing. 
for me is show me the science, show me the doctor's reports, speak to me about the medicine, speak to me about the science. But the first thing that happened that day is I have this large cactus plant just outside my front door. And it flowers once a year. My family gets very excited when it flowers because it's just such a great symbol of hope and life that this big ugly thing with thorns has one big giant white flower once a year. And it only lasts for a day. And that night when you come back, the little bud is dead. And then we wait again for the next year. It's almost as exciting as March lilies coming up. Except this day, it was in full bloom again. But I know it had flowered just three weeks before that. I knew it had flowered because I'd actually broken off the little bud and put it on the little concrete bench next to it. And I'd left it there hoping for it to dry it and see if I could maybe get some seeds or some other way of propagating it. And yet this plant, which only flowers once a year, had blossomed again. And I said to my wife, this is really weird. We decided to take an Uber because we didn't want to hassle with parking and driving. And while we were sitting there, a little bird. I know what it was. My wife didn't. She, she said, we've never seen these ones in our area. It was a little pale wing starling. Came and sat next to me, literally next to me, and sang a song for, to me for about three minutes. Glennis took photographs. I was like, what the hell is going on? Who is this little guy and what the hell is he trying to say to me? I went to the hospital and my plastic surgeon was gone. And so they gave me another plastic surgeon. And he was so excited, he was running up and down the thing as if he had done the operation. I was like, they'd done a slightly interesting form of, of re rehabilitating my shoulder. And so he was very excited about it, that it had worked and it worked so well. But he was carrying on like it was his operation. And like he'd done really well. And I thought, hmm, this is quite good. I went and sat up in the, the unit, and every single thing I did that day, there was a message in it. I ended up sitting with three other people who all had identical cancers to me, literally melanomas of the back. One of the guys had had the operation on the same day as me, and while I was there, they rushed in and they took him back to theater because things had gone horribly wrong. There were two other people that had had the operations. The one lady, it had gone, but it had spread and it spread to her throat and she'd had multiple operations. She'd had the chemo, she was having the radiotherapy and I was speaking to her and she said she was in agony and it was really, really tough going and it had been about two years now. And then the other guy was sitting next to me, it was a real pain. But the reality is he'd had the same melanomas out and he'd been fighting it for six years. And it had it slowly spread to all these different parts of his body. And one of the things that horrified me is that his hands were swollen up like little mittens from the lymphedema. And I said, what happened? He said, because they've taken out so many lymph nodes, that his body can't clear the waste. And I was looking at all these horror stories, thinking to myself, you know, one thing to be positive, but there are so many things that can still go wrong. And so the real proof of the pudding is going to be, is when I find out what's, what's next, is do I still have the courage to, to do the next part of the walk? And then I went in to see all the doctors and they all sat around and there was the chief oncologist and she looked at me and she said, I don't know what's going on. She said, but we can find absolutely no trace. Now I've spoken to many people and said, oh, this is, this is quite normal. This is quite normal. Sometimes you get cancer and they take it all out and it's fine. But she said, you know, Mr. Detoy, with the depth that it had in you and, and everything pointed out to us that this had spread and we were preparing you for the worst. But she says, and, and these were her actual words, she says, you've dodged a bullet. She said, normally at this stage we would start going through the chemo process um, just as a preventative. But she said, I don't even think you need that. So go home, come back in six months' time, come back in 12 months' time, and we can talk again. Well, relief, relief, enormous. From one minute being told that you had three months to 12 months left to live, to the next day saying, Andre, you've got a second chance. Wow, what an amazing thing. And as I walked out, she said to me, don't forget to ring the healing bell. Now, I've photographed the healing bell in one of my Facebook posts, because I discovered this bell. I actually sat underneath it for an entire morning, not knowing what it was. And underneath there's a little plaque, and it says, when you are finally healed, when you do that last treatment, go ring the bell. So I'm sitting in a, in, a, in a waiting room with probably 60 or 70 people. Every person there has cancer, and I would say every person there was worse than I was. And what happens is that it was terrible. We had just had a guy coming out of chemo and vomiting his heart out in the, in the waiting room, just from the effects of the medicine. So it was not pleasant. 
And so I walked up there and I did the, the obligatory Facebook post, you know, sort of hand on the bell and Glennie was taking some photographs and it all looked nice. And then madness overtook me and I rang the bell really loud. And the entire ward, or well, the whole waiting room, jumped up. Because you know what it was? It was hope. There was a chance for them. It was my chance, but it was a chance for them. We managed to get outside. Wow, emotions so high. And we called the Uber. And I said to Glennis, let's get home. Let's go home. Let's go have a glass of champagne. We called the Uber. And when the Uber came, guess what his name was? Hope. Hope. Can you believe it? A day of miracles, a day where I had actually been given that second chance. But very often when these things happen, the trauma and all the mental anguish that you go through means that you have to understand some of these things. So I want to tell you some of the lessons that I've learned. I've said one or two. The words that we say are very important. That we need to stay positive regardless of what happens around us, and especially in COVID times. We've got to continuously plan for that future. We've got to look for that purpose. But there were some other things that also helped me. And I think that honestly, many of these things may have been the reason why I'm still standing here today. The first thing is, is that I shared it with my network. And I'm not saying share these things publicly. It's not always the right thing to do. But what had happened, the outpouring of positive goodwill had been so amazing to change my attitude, to be able to say to me, Andre, that there are so many people out there that care for you. There are so many people who want the best for you. So even though we don't see each other every single day, and that's not what friends are about. We don't have to see. I saw somebody the other day and she said, but I haven't seen you for ages. I didn't even know if we were still friends. I said, we'll be friends forever and ever. Because the reality is, is that the number of times we see each other is, is irrelevant. It's the input that we put into each other's lives. That is what's important. So this positive outpouring, and if you believe in the universe or any of those things, I always think the universe finds it very hard to kill someone off when three or 4,000 people are saying, this is a good guy, don't kill him off. He's nice, you know, yay. I can't tell you how many nights when I was having those panic attacks, just reading those positive inspirational messages, how they carried me through the night and through to the next day. The second thing, and I have to acknowledge this, is that I had so many people praying for me. Three, four, five thousand people. People with me. My gardener came and said his church had like a 30-minute session for me. It's like, but they don't know me. And he was like, that doesn't matter. We care. And we want you to do. So I had this massive outpouring. I found it quite hard to speak about. Um, because interestingly enough, my entire medical team, there wasn't a Christian person that I was aware of on the entire team. There was a Muslim, there was an Orthodox Jew, there was even a black plastic surgeon who believed in the ancestral worship. There was all kinds of different things. So it was very difficult for me to say this was the God of Jesus that had healed me. But all I know is that somewhere along the line, the power of prayer makes an enormous difference. And one of the things that I've started doing is looking again at what do I really believe? What is that faith thing? Because without faith, life can be enormously difficult. When I thought I was dying, uh, you go through the process and you say, well, what happens if it's lung cancer? What happens if it's this? What am I going to do? What is the process? And I have so many friends. And guys, thank you out there. But please don't feel offended by this. But I thought to myself, if I was sitting there and it was my last few days, you know who I wanted there? I wanted my close family. I wanted my wife. I wanted my mother. I wanted my daughter. I didn't want all the rest of you. I said, oh, that sounds terrible. Maybe one or two of you, if you had some special skills. But the reality is that those relationships that we create with our close inner circle are absolutely key. Absolutely key. We keep hearing these things. Those moments of clarity. When something happens in your family, and we suddenly hear of somebody death dying. You suddenly realize I should have just told my mother once more that I love her. Or maybe I should have just taken my wife out to that dinner that I always said that I was going to take her and I didn't take her. And so for me, that little family unit for me was one of the huge sources of inspiration. As much shock and trauma as it was for me, it was for them. But literally within a week, they turned around and they became my sole providers of support. 
They literally carried me through this process. The last thing is, is that I think my own personal attitude had a lot to do with it. I think if you can control your own personal psyche, if you can believe there's always something better out there, there's something good to come. So I'm busy trying to write all this down and see if I can actually get it, all my thoughts down onto paper. And there's only one thing that I can call it. And I want to share this with you today. It's called Just Breathe. Because when times are tough, when things are really difficult, the first thing that we just have to do is just breathe. When COVID just seems like it's just too much, when it says that your business is going down or you have no more money or that you've lost somebody special or the amount of people that have come through your special or you've been so lonely, you've been stuck in the same place. I want to say to you is that be positive. Believe that the best is still to come, that good things are still coming. And remember, just breathe. Thank you.